Welcome to the 4WD Mechanics How-To Series. In this segment, we're doing a front disc brake pad change on a 1990-2006 Jeep vehicle. This project begins by safely supporting the beam front axle on jack stands. These stands are rated 5 tons apiece and safely support the vehicle at the beam axle tubes. An air wrench speeds up the process of removing the wheels. Lift the wheel and tire straight off the wheel hub. Now you can inspect the rotor. This rotor has scoring on it as well as grooves from wear. Warpage or runout is a critical concern with disc brake rotors. The vibration when brakes are applied is often warpage and runout. A 13 mm socket extension and ratchet easily removes the two bolts that hold the calipers in place. In this 1990 up era, the disc brake pad materials do not contain asbestos. This particular brake work does not have asbestos hazards. When purchasing replacement brake pads or brake shoes, make sure that the materials do not contain asbestos. Remove both bolts and carefully pry the caliper loose from the caliper mounting bracket. Do not pry against the brake pad material. Pry between the caliper mounting bracket and the cast iron caliper casting. If the brake rotor is deeply grooved, you may have to shift the pads over slightly to enable the caliper to come loose from the rotor. Your aim is to retract the piston in the caliper and give the brake pads more clearance. Inspect the pad thickness and condition and inspect the rotor carefully. This rotor has wear, scoring, and grooves. The thickness will determine whether the rotor can be resurfaced and reused. Measure the rotor thickness with a micrometer. Inspect the pads for scoring and the thickness of the pad lining. Inspect the caliper for leaks before hanging the caliper up and out of the way. Take care not to damage the brake hose when you're hanging the caliper or handling the caliper. Jeep vehicles in this era all have unit type front wheel bearings. This is a unit hub, a semi-floating arrangement with the axle shaft running through it. Check for bearing roughness by rotating the flange. Hold the flange at 12 and 6 o'clock and try to rock it to see if there's any play in the bearing. Because we're sure there's no asbestos in this lining material, we can vacuum the caliper. Most vacuums do not have the ability to contain asbestos, however. And if you suspect that there's asbestos in the brake materials, do not use a vacuum. Push this pad inward enough to clear the tab and pull the pad outward. There's a locating pin on each side of the pad. These are the pins that need to clear the caliper before the pad will come loose. Here are the wear bars on the pad. Show how much wear there is on the lining. And on the back side of the pad, you can see the two pins that had to clear the caliper. The pad on the piston side is very easy to remove. Just pull straight outward and the spring clips will loosen from the piston. This pad also shows wear. Quality replacement rotors are not expensive and in this case the wear on the original rotor was such that it was cost effective to replace the rotor. New rotors come pre-finished to seat the pads quickly and provide substantial braking and quick seating of the new lining. Denatured alcohol is a traditional cleaning substance for brake systems. There are several precautions that go along with the use of denatured alcohol. It is highly toxic, should not be consumed, and this substance, if it gets into your bloodstream, is highly poisonous. Wear protective gloves when handling denatured alcohol. If you have cuts or abrasions, do not apply denatured alcohol. All residue has been removed from the new rotor. The brake pad manufacturer provides an illustration of where to use anti-squeal on the brake pads. Here we're applying the anti-squeal to the new brake pads. 
The goal is to apply an even film to the backside of the brake pads, to the contact points, and those other areas illustrated in that diagram. This is a paste and will allow it to dry completely before installing the brake pads. Avoid getting anti-squeal on the brake pad material. Use the paste only on the metal and backside of the brake pads. Apply at the friction points. This is where squeal and friction noises develop. By using this paste, you'll reduce the risk of any kind of brake noise. This paste serves as a water and friction barrier as well, allowing these parts to slide and move as they need to in service. Set the pads aside to dry. Allow them to dry thoroughly before installing them in the calipers. It's this attention to detail that makes for a better brake job. Coat the back side of each pad. Coat the friction areas. A uniform film will do the best job. For water fording or exposure to moisture, this is the best solution. Now coat the bolts that hold the caliper to the caliper bracket. Make sure the bolts were clean before you coat them. Put a uniform coating on each of the four bolts. Anti-squeal paste will prevent these bolts from seizing and make it easier to do your next brake job. Here is graphic proof for why we're changing these brake pads. Look at the wear bars and the thickness of the pad at the right. Because the new pad is thicker, the piston needs to retract in its bore. This will push brake fluid back up to the master cylinder, so keep tabs on how full the master cylinder is as you move the piston into its bore. This C-clamp does an excellent job. Turn the screw very slowly because you're forcing brake fluid back up through the lines and into the master cylinder. Once the piston is retracted completely, you can loosen the C-clamp. When using a C-clamp or a caliper spreader tool, make sure you don't damage the seal around the piston. Protect the seal and keep the stem centered in the piston as you tighten and loosen it. A caliper spreader tool is available, but this C-clamp works just as well. Make sure that you retract each of the sleeves and that they move freely in the caliper. Inspect these boots as well. Any signs of wear or the piston frozen in its bore means time to replace or rebuild the caliper. These are the steps involved with the typical rebuild of a disc brake caliper. This happens to be a 1987-90 to 90 Jeep Wrangler caliper. After carefully removing the seal, you can hone the bore of the caliper using a silicon brush type hone. Rust and pitting are common problems, especially with Jeep vehicles that have been exposed to moisture or even stream crossings. Measure the bore after honing with an inside micrometer. If the bore is round and concentric, look for pitting or signs of a rough surface that would damage or cause binding of the piston. The condition of the piston surface is critical, as this is where the seal takes place. Any scoring, excessive wear, or damage to the piston surface means it's time for a new caliper or a rebuilt caliper. Like the rotors, there's no point in taking chances with a worn caliper. Replace the caliper and for the best performance replace the opposite side caliper at the same time. Note the location of these tabs. They go in a specific direction at each caliper. Note the method of installation here. Follow these steps closely and refer back to this section if you need to. It's important that the tabs locate in the holes as you see here. Again, note the orientation of these parts. The two button tabs are important for keeping the pad centered in the caliper. Again, the slots on the ends of the pads must face in the correct direction. These tab locations will be the same for each pad. Make sure that you're using the correct pad at each caliper. The piston side pad is very easy to install. Center it up carefully and snap it into place. Make sure the pads are seated completely, that they're uniform and even, 
that the end tabs match. Look the caliper over thoroughly, retract the sleeves, and make sure that everything is in place before installing the caliper over the top of the rotor. Once you're sure the caliper is ready to install, hang the caliper aside and make sure that you don't twist the brake hose in the process. The next step is to install the rotor on the hub flange. The rotor must be free of debris and cleaned as we did with denatured alcohol. Seat the rotor squarely. Make sure that it seats on the studs and is centered, not cocked off to one side or setting on a ledge of a stud. Spring retainers are helpful, but discarded, especially when aftermarket wheels are installed that must fit flat against the brake rotor. With the bolt sleeves retracted, you can install the caliper, setting it over the top of the rotor. Note the position of the tabs. This is the parts layout on the left side of the vehicle. Loctite 242 medium strength blue is a good safety precaution on the bolts that hold the caliper to the mounting bracket. Thread locker applied. This is a quick way to make sure that the thread locker is uniformly spread on the threads of two bolts. Now you can insert the bolts through the sleeves that retain the caliper to the caliper mounting bracket. These are fine threads. Start them carefully. Run the bolts in by fingertips and make sure that they are seated before applying wrench pressure. Here, I take the bolts up uniformly with a ratchet and socket. Make them snug at this point, you'll use a torque wrench for final torque setting. This torque wrench is calibrated and all spring tension is removed between uses. The factory listed torque for these caliper mounting bolts is 11 foot-pounds on this Jeep XJ Cherokee. The ZJ Grand Cherokee calls for 7 to 15 foot-pounds. As a safety precaution, I will set these bolts at 12 foot-pounds, which will work well for the YJ and TJ Wrangler and also for the Grand Cherokee. This is the orientation of the caliper and also the routing of the brake hose. Make note of the brake hose orientation before taking the caliper loose and after installing the caliper. Make sure the brake hose will not chafe against the tire and wheel. Now we move to the right side of the vehicle. The right front rotor is also scored and has deeper grooves. We can mic this for thickness. It's already apparent that this rotor will not be able to be resurfaced. You can retract the caliper piston with a C-clamp before removing these two bolts. Making sure that the pads clear the groove at the top of the rotor, we can pry the caliper loose. Note the brake hose orientation, and as you turn the caliper over, do not kink or corkscrew the brake hose. Inspect the caliper for leaks. Look for damage anywhere on the caliper. Use mechanics wire to safely tie up the caliper away from the work area. The coil spring will make a good place to tie this caliper out of the way. Inspect the brake hose. This brake hose has plastic coating that is shredding from the hose. The braided section and the interior of the hose are still okay. Protect the brake hose when you hang the caliper away from the work area. Remove the brake rotor. You can now inspect the hub and the brake rotor. This brake rotor has deep grooves. Miking it would be of little purpose. We'll install a new rotor in this case. Remove the brake pads as you did at the left side caliper. Start with the outer pad. Remember the two tabs. The inner pad should be grabbed evenly and pulled away from the disc caliber piston. Make sure that the seals and all other parts of the caliper are in good condition. Here, we are confident that the brake pad material did not contain asbestos, 
We installed that lining earlier. This shop vacuum has a filter on the exhaust and an inner bag that captures contaminants but will not contain microscopic asbestos. Clean around the unit hub and the backside of the flange. Make sure the flange is clean as well so that the rotor will fit flushly against the flange. Clean the dust vacuum plate and clean up any additional debris around the caliper. You can now retract the piston in the caliper board. Use a C-clamp for this purpose. The back side of the C-clamp is against the hose bolt. The stem is centered in the piston. Turn the screw very slowly. You're forcing brake fluid back up through the brake lines and into the master cylinder. Make sure you do not cause fluid to spill out of the master cylinder onto a painted area under the hood. Once the piston is completely retracted, you can remove the C-clamp carefully. Do not damage the dust seal in the process. The brake anti-squeal compound is completely dry at this point. Center up the three tensioning springs on the inner pad. Push the springs into the bore of the caliper piston and make sure that the pad is moving freely. Make sure these bushing sleeves move freely and that the boots are undamaged. Move the bushings away from the brake pad to provide enough clearance for the caliper to fit over the bracket. Now you can install the second brake pad. The outer pad has the springs that fit over the outside arms of the caliper. Remember the two tabs. They must locate in the respective holes. You can clearly see whether the two tabs are locating in the holes of the caliper body. The pad itself should be flat against the arms and the spring should be in their proper positions as well. Note the location of the tabs on these pads. Use denatured alcohol on a rag to clean the rotor. If you have any cuts or abrasions on your fingers, make a point of using nitrile gloves. You can absorb denatured alcohol into your bloodstream and it is highly toxic. Protect yourself from brake fluid as well. Be sure to read the labels on any of these products. The notched tabs on the brake pads go downward to the lower portion of the brake caliper support bracket. Make sure they're centered over the bracket as you slide the caliper into place. Keep the caliper aligned and do not force the parts. If the caliper does not slide into position readily, look for a reason. Here's the thread locker application using two bolts. Apply thread locker to each bolt and then run the threads together. This provides a uniform coating on each of the thread sets and also prevents wasting costly thread locker. With the caliper and its two bushing sleeves aligned with the bracket, install the bolts. Make sure you start the threads by hand. Bring them up as far as you can by hand before applying a wrench. After tightening with a socket and ratchet, you'll use a torque wrench for final torque. Make sure the bracket threads and the threads on these two bolts are in good condition and clean before applying thread locker and installing the caliper. Next, we'll use a ratchet and socket to snug up the bolts. Final torque will once again be set with a torque wrench. We'll make sure that our torque setting for this XJ Cherokee is 12 foot-pounds. Tightening the bolts uniformly and in cross, we bring them up to specification. With the caliper installed, center up the rotor and make sure that the rotor turns freely inside the brake pads. If the piston in the caliper moves freely, there should be no problem with this brake job. Here you can see the relationship of the parts and the fit of the brake pads and caliper. Note the tabs on the end of the pads and how they fit against the caliper mounting bracket. 
The brake hose follows its original shape and routing, and this will prevent the brake hose from chafing against the wheel and tire. Always make sure that the brake hose is in good condition. With all this movement, check the torque on the hose bolt. It should be 23 foot-pounds. Look over the caliper installation closely. Note the alignment of the pad tabs and their orientation to the bracket. Look closely at the spring locations and the lower tabs as they should be aligning with the bracket. The final step in the front disc brake pad replacement is to make sure that the brake fluid is at the normal level in the master cylinder. Always use the recommended brake fluid. If DOT3 is recommended, you can use DOT3 or DOT4. DOT5 should not be mixed with either DOT3 or DOT4 brake fluid. Read the label on the master cylinder or read your owner's handbook. Clean your hands and around the master cylinder before removing the cap. Do not allow debris to fall into the master cylinder when you remove the cap. Be careful about spilling brake fluid on painted surfaces. Brake fluid should only be at the full line of the master cylinder reservoir. Do not overfill or underfill the reservoir. With the vehicle raised, set the wheels and tires squarely on the wheel hub flanges. I tighten the wheel nuts with an air wrench bringing them up to less torque than the final torque, which is set with a torque wrench. Torque the wheel nuts in cross and torque the wheel lock as well. I set the nuts on these alloy wheels to 110 foot-pounds. Road test the vehicle carefully and recheck the brake fluid at the master cylinder reservoir.